If you're planning to go low carb, get to the gym, and start an intermittent fasting protocol in order to reach your fitness and health goals for the year, I want you to consider one additional key player that could inhibit you from being successful in the coming year. But before I go over that key factor, I just want to make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell so you're notified every time we post a new video. I appreciate your support and I ask that you comment and post all of your questions right here so I can answer them and come up with content that can serve you best. So let's get right to it. The missing factor that most people do not consider when it comes to designing a new program is the idea of what we call satiety, being satiated. How do we get satiated when we eat? You know, we live in such a world of abundance that everything that has ever been called food in the history of the planet is very inexpensive for us within arm's reach at every supermarket. And that level of abundance has never been seen before. So it's very important that when we make choices for the different foods that we're going to eat, that those choices are foods that can satiate us, that can make us feel satisfied. So here's what it feels like to be satiated. Have you ever been really, really thirsty? And you grab a big jug of water and you just start guzzling it and you drink until you're basically full, until your body says, I can't drink any more water. I mean, we've all tried, right? We all think we're not getting enough water. But if you need water, you'll be thirsty. And if you drink water and you're no longer thirsty, you're satiated. So food should do the same thing. But how many times have you gotten up from a very satisfying dinner, maybe a big steak and some broccoli, and you're just full. And then within five minutes, somebody drops a dessert in front of you, and of course, there's always room for dessert. And that's because there are certain foods that are satiating and other foods that are not satiating. So we wanna make sure that we understand how we get satiated. Now, there's a lot involved here. There's blood sugar, there's hormones, there's a lot to consider, but we're gonna simplify it for you here. We're gonna make it something that you know we really can grasp. Now, this idea of satiety is this is the time to talk about it because the most popular medications for type 2 diabetes and now obesity and now even just modest weight loss are these GLP-1 agonist medications like Ozempic, Munjaro, Trisepatide, etc. And what do they do? Well, they do three things. These medications move food more slowly out of the stomach. That's one thing that will contribute to satiety. These medications also increase your production of insulin from your pancreas. And these drugs will also stimulate a part of your brain called the hypothalamus that has a neurotransmitter like effect we really don't understand this one this is the brain impact this is what tells your brain you're not hungry that you're satiated so we know these three medications do this now how can we use this to our advantage without having to spend you know what could be thousands and thousands of dollars just to get a year's worth of this type of medication there's a lot of side effects associated with these medications we're not promoting these medications but many of you who are watching this would like to do as much as you can on your own. And many of you who are on these medications would also like to do more on your own because you'd like to stop taking the medication one day. These drugs are not designed to take forever. And we know that within two years of stopping the drug, most people gain 75% of their weight back. And I think if the studies went beyond two years, you'd find that 100% would probably gain all of their weight back. So that's not a good long-term plan for success. So what we want to do is basically understand these mechanisms and how the food that we have access to today can either promote satiety or inhibit satiety. So just to review with the GLP-1 agonist medications, Ozempic, Trisepatide, etc., we know there's one, a local effect. That local effect slows the emptying of your stomach. Number two, there's a hormonal effect. You're going to increase the amount of insulin that you produce. It's going to prevent your blood sugar from getting too high and actually getting too low, believe it or not. And there's a brain effect or a neurotransmitter effect, and this is what goes to the hypothalamus in the brain and says, hey, we've eaten enough. So I mentioned before about how you can't over drink water, right? But we all have people that we know who might be alcoholics, right? These are the kind of people that noon comes on Sunday afternoon and they start cracking their beer, watching the pregame for the football. They're gonna crack a beer basically every waking moment until they pass out that night after the last game. And those are alcoholics. Those are people who are just cracking beer after beer after beer, nonstop until they pass out. Now, beer is 96% water, but there's alcohol in there. 
and alcohol does not have a trigger or a mechanism to tell you you've had enough. Now, if you were trying to do that with water, if that person was just cracking a pole in spring water and just drinking bottle after bottle after bottle, there's no way you could just continuously drink water all day because your body would say you have this auto regulatory mechanism to say enough, I've had enough water. Well, that is also true with food. We know that if you tried to eat a big tomahawk steak, let's just say you were starving, you went out hiking all day and you're gone for 12 hours and you had nothing to eat and you came back starving and there was five tomahawk ribeye steaks on the grill, you would look at those steaks and say, boy, I, I'm gonna eat like three of them. But they're monsters, right? They're like 60 ounce steaks. You get through one, there's no way you're taking a bite. You're completely full. You may not even have finished that whole one. And like I said, somebody takes that plate away, drops a chocolate cake in front of you, and of course, there's always room for dessert. Well, protein and fat, like water, have that auto-regulatory mechanism to tell you you've had enough, that you're satiated, whereas dessert or sugar or carbohydrates do not have that. Now, there are some carbohydrates like fruit and vegetables that have enough fiber in there. Fiber can stimulate satiety and that's important because we're gonna talk about how carbohydrates and fats are mixed and how that is actually a problem. So satiety or being satiated is only gonna come from certain foods, but it's gonna be prevented by other foods. Now, many of the foods that you'll find in the supermarket, and especially if you're watching football, many of the foods that are advertised to you are processed foods, highly processed foods. In nature, if you're going to eat a fish, a steak, an avocado, olives. These are foods that have fat and fiber together, like in the example of olives and avocado, or fat and protein together, like eggs, steak, fish, animal products. The combination in animal products of fat and protein is something that our genetics is used to, and therefore our body knows how to deal with it. The combination of fat and fiber is something that our bodies are used to and our genetics has dealt with for all of human history. But the combination of fat and carbohydrate is something that's relatively new to us. And that's how we make comfort foods. Think about all of the comfort foods. You have, you know, lasagna with all that pasta, and then you got the cheese on top. So you have your fat together with a refined carbohydrate. It's refined because it's a grain, wheat, that was pulverized into a powder, and then that powder was put together to make pasta, and then we combine it with fats. Now, chips, think about corn chips. You take corn, you pulverize it into a powder, you turn it into a tortilla, and then you deep fry it in some oil, and now you have a refined carbohydrate and an oil or a fat combined. And this is the recipe for disaster because these foods taste so good and they have no mechanism, kind of like becoming an alcoholic. There's no auto-regulatory mechanism to tell you to stop. You can just keep eating and eating and eating and this is where food addiction comes from. So the combination of fat and carbohydrates in processed food is the first thing you have to do, You've, the first thing you have to cut out. Now, carbohydrates alone doesn't have to be combined with fat. Carbohydrates alone lack the ability to make us feel satiated. But most carbohydrates are in the form of fruits and vegetables, and therefore there is enough fiber in there to give us a satiety signal. However, what we find is that some people are intolerant of levels of fiber that are that high, and if you're taking in fiber with fat, then you're creating this environment in your body where your body doesn't necessarily partition the fuel as well as it would otherwise. If proteins combined with fat like we see in steak or fish or eggs, the protein will be used primarily for our structure, our bones and our muscle, and the fat will be used for fuel. Fat can also be used for structure, but not like protein is used for structure. Fat is very dense in energy. So the same unit of fat, the same weight of fat compared to carbohydrate has more than double the calories, right? So we have nine calories per gram in fat and four calories per gram in carbohydrates. So fat is very dense energy and we use it very efficiently in our body. However, if we're taking in fat and carbohydrate, that carbohydrate is so easily processed and so quickly available to us that we will prefer to use the carbohydrate and that fat will then have to be stored, right? Now, people watching this who've been into this type of science for a long time will say, yes, but if you eat fat without the carbohydrate, fat is a better source of energy. And that's true. Your body will 
still use either dietary or body fat very efficiently. But when it comes to dietary energy, food, you take in fat and carbohydrate at the same time, you will use the carbohydrate as an immediate energy source just because it's so easy for your body to digest and process and fat has a better long-term need or long-term use as body fat. So now what we have are pro these processed foods and now by processed that's a whole other category. This video is not going to go on forever. We're going to touch on a lot of these topics. What we want to do is also on a future video discuss what does the processing do, right? So when we process fats, where are we getting those fats from? And when we process carbohydrates, what are we doing to them? Because carbohydrates typically come with fiber, right? But what we do when we process it is we remove the fiber. We leave the carbohydrate in there. Now, fiber in your body is indigestible, indigestible to all mammals. What we do is the carbohydrate that's housed in the fiber that we can't get to is carried past our small intestines. It avoids being sucked into our liver. That fiber is dragged into our colon where bacteria use it as food. And that bacteria will use it, digest all of the carbohydrate in that fiber for the benefit of the bacteria while exchanging to us short chain fatty acids, which we use and have wonderful other effects that we can discuss in, at a later date. However, when we process carbohydrates, we remove the fiber and now the carbohydrate content lands in our small intestines and it's absorbed. And when it's absorbed, it gets shuttled off to the liver and then the liver has to deal with it. What does the liver do with it? Well, you know, sugar is toxic. I, you know, you may have heard me say in previous videos that sugar is very tightly regulated. Anything that gives gives us a boost of sugar in our blood. We have to do backflips to get rid of it. So too much or too little sugar in the bloodstream is absolutely toxic. So what do we do? We send it to the liver and we convert it into fat and then we ship that fat out onto little boats called cholesterol and we circulate it around the body and we store fat away. Some of that cholesterol and triglycerides will just circulate in your bloodstream and cause other problems. But the main thing to consider is that that carbohydrate should have never made it into the bloodstream through the small intestines to get to the, directly to the liver. It should have been dragged, much of it should have been dragged down into the large intestines where the bacteria would have gobbled up a lot of that carbohydrate. And again, that's not to say when you eat broccoli, you don't get any of the carbohydrate in your small intestines, you'll get some. But when you process food, you basically change the ratio enough to wreak havoc on our system. So when we take wheat or any grain and we process it and remove the fiber and, and dissociate the food and make pasta out of it, now we have this processed carbohydrate that's mainlining sugar or fructose or sucrose right into our bloodstream and into our liver where it has to be managed. Now, same thing with fat. Where are we getting our fats from? Processed fats, right? Oils are meant to be something that, that are easy to manage. You know, the whole reason we created margarine to begin with is because lard was solid at room temperature. We wanted something that was spreadable and, you know, we looked for convenience. We started to move away from animal fat, saturated fats into unsaturated fats, in particular polyunsaturated fats called seed oils. These go through a chemical process. You couldn't get soybean oil from a soybean just by squeezing it, like you can get olive oil from an olive just by squeezing it. So fruit oils, coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, those are fruit oils. They're pressed oils. You just press it and you get the oil from, it's not processed. Whereas canola, soybean, seed oils, these are all go through a chemical processing system. And we take that and food scientists are not necessarily interested in our health. They're not doctors. Food scientists are there to create consistency and taste that make us want more. And it's through that science that we have these processed oils combined with processed carbohydrates, creating food that is energy dense. Think about it, all that carbohydrate, all that fat, it's just getting right into our bloodstream. And that is energy density, but nutrient deficient. Energy density, but nutrient deficient. First of all, those aren't essential fatty acids. Those fats are useless to us. And we could look at the research and say that it has all these negative downstream effects. And that's probably true. But then people would say, well, saturated fat from animals also have negative downstream effect. And that could be true. I'm not here to argue that point. I'm just saying, genetically, we've had access to saturated fat found in animals through all of, you know, for millions of years. And what we're seeing now is just brand new. Genetically, you know, our genes haven't seen this before. We haven't had to process this. So I would much rather have what all of my ancestors have had exposure to in the past 
than to have something that's recently created in a laboratory. So this is the topic of today, and we're going to dive a whole lot deeper into uh, food processing. But the main takeaways here are processed foods are devoid of nu nutrients, but energy dense. Weight gain occurs when we have an energy surplus. Weight loss occurs when we have an energy deficit. And if you're energy neutral, you don't gain weight and you don't lose weight. And that's just overly simplistic. I get it. We do need to talk about the hormonal effects that different foods have. We can't look at protein as just an energy source because it's not. Even though we give it a classification of four calories per gram, just like carbohydrates, our body doesn't use protein for energy unless it absolutely has to in a desperate situation. And that's not something any of us really experience. We use protein to build our bodies, right? Your body is nothing but protein and fat and water, not carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is pure energy. Fat is energy and structure, but there's so much energy in fat that it's mostly used for energy and some of it is used for structure, but protein is used for structure. And it's so important to, when you try to lose weight and go into a calorie deficit, to not go into a protein deficit. That's a key point. And we're going to talk about how to go into a deficit and not suffer the consequences of all of the contestants of The Biggest Loser, which is their metabolism slows down so much that any mild increase in their caloric intake, which was rock bottom to begin with, is going to result in all their weight com coming back. So these are all important things to understand because we live in a world of such abundance that we really have no choice but to learn this stuff because our ancestors did not have access to this level of abundance. Forget your ancestors, your grandparents didn't have access to this kind of abundance. So this is why we're seeing such difficulty for people, not only with weight gain and obesity, but you know, in type 2 diabetes and heart disease, all the obvious things, but I believe there's a really strong component here for mental health and you know the nutrition that your body has access to will dictate hormone levels will dictate neurotransmitter levels and you know these are all things that that contribute to not only our physical health but our mental health okay with all that being said in future videos we want to talk about that energy density we want to learn a little bit about the hormones we want to learn about cortisol we want to learn about insulin we're going to dive deeper into that but today we just wanted to introduce the topic of satiety, being satiated, what interferes with satiety, what contributes to satiety. Because when you're satiated and you're eating foods that are far more difficult to digest and process, that slows your gastric emptying, that accomplishes one of the main factors that we know these medications accomplish. We're also going to see with the slower emptying of the gastric contents, we're going to see a better reaction to the presence of those foods by having a more appropriate insulin response. And finally, when you have fiber or fat or protein, which were designed to be satiated, well, then that's going to make it as a signal to the brain and hypothalamus, which is going to stimulate our satiety centers the way we know it can. So all of the three factors that these medications accomplish, your lifestyle and your diet can accomplish as long as you're making the right choices. Now, if you want to eat comfort foods and have all of those benefits, then you can go take the risk with the medication, and a lot of people do that, and that's fine. However, if you don't want to take the medication and you want to experience the benefits, this is the way to do it.